Okay, take it away, Rob. All right, it's good to be with you, if only by Zoom. Sorry, I couldn't be with you in person, but I'm really excited tonight um, to take us into another world, the world of the former inhabitants and traditional peoples of, of our area in uh, Chester and Delaware counties. You can see from the map, this is the area that's called the Lenape Hoking. It's the homeland of the Lenape people. Uh, Chulinsak means birds. So we're going to get into their world, and it uh, will be fun. Since I can't see you, please put uh, put your thoughts in the chat, or if you're in the room, hold on to them. And, uh, we'll look forward to uh, any comments or questions you have at the end. So to get us started with the Lenape people, uh, there's three different dialects of the Lenape language that you can see here. We're, uh, our area was the Unami dialect, and that's the dialect that we will be working with tonight. Um, the Lenape peoples, again, this is their their homeland, but you can see from the map, they were forced uh, to resettle outside of their homeland. And uh, several different groups of the different uh, of the different dialects went to different places. Uh, the, our people mostly ended up in Oklahoma. And there's a couple different places where they are. Um, there are three federally recognized uh, Lenape or Delaware Indian uh, tribes, and uh, two of them in Oklahoma, one in Wisconsin. Some of them made it all the way up into Canada, and so there's three recognized Canadian First Nations that are part of our people here. And then there are state-recognized Lenape tribes in Delaware and two in New Jersey. Um, so they're, 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 they don't live here now, but they are still out there. They are still a uh, culture and it's very vibrant, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about language issues in a moment. What you may notice here is there is no group in Pennsylvania. And um, there's, there's some controversy about that. There is a Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania group and they have been getting a lot of attention and press and I don't wanna really talk about them too much other than to say that um, they are not accepted by the federally and state recognized tribes. And so uh, if you have a question about that, we can talk about it later. Uh, when I first moved to Pennsylvania almost 20 years ago, there was, there was this uh, uh, prophecy of the four crows and a whole exhibit uh, down at the Penn Museum. And I was very excited because I've, I've always been interested in how different cultures experience birds. And, and here was this prophecy. I blogged about it at the time on my blog. Very exciting, uh, beautiful logo. Only problem is, as I said, um, this was coming from this Pennsylvania group and completely rejected by the other federally recognized Lenape people. So. They claim that this fourth crow prophecy is spurious, it's not real. And so it's just an example of some of the controversy that happens here as we're trying to understand our, uh, our neighbors and their culture. And there, there is conflict around this, this issue of who is Lenape. And I don't wanna to spend too much time on it, but I do need to, at least from the perspective of the Delaware Nation in Oklahoma, present their perspective that this is not an accurate traditional uh, Lenape thing, this four crow prophecy. So I've got to do a little myth busting just at the beginning here. Here's another one. You may have seen this book in your library, The Rainbow Crow. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great story of how the crow got all black. Um, but it's, again, not considered to be an actual Lenape story. It may be loosely based on a Cherokee uh, story, but again, not a Lenape true story. So a little crazy. Uh, finally, when I first moved here, I was told that Wawa was the Lenape Indian name for the Canada goose. There's the logo 
uh, for Wawa. And it turns out that is a not accurate as well, though it is kind of interesting. Wawa is actually an Ojibwa word, which is a related language, an Ojibwa word for snow goose. So not the right goose, not the right language, but it is, it is a, an actual word in the Ojibwa language. Well, how did that come to be the name of the place where we like to get hoagies? Well, uh, Wawa was popularized as a name in Longfellow's The Song of Hiawatha, which was published in 1855. He used a lot of Ojibwa names for, for animals and birds in that long, long poem. And in the 1870s, Edward Worth, who was the founder of the Wawa estate, created uh, the Wawa estate because there, he named it Wawa because there were a lot of geese on his pond. They were Canada geese at the pond, but that's where the Wawa comes into the estate. Then the dairy is created and then the Wawa stores in 1964. So there's this tradition of the Wawa for over a hundred years. And then in 1980, when Albert Marsano created the logo that we all know that you're looking at right now, he put a Canada goose in there because they've lost track of where this word had come from and what it really originally meant. So when you look at that Wawa and you see you see the logo, you see the Canada goose, little little bit of the joke is on us all, I guess, because Wawa is not Lenape and it's not Canada goose. Uh, do want to have a little shout out to those who actually brought us the 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 information that Longfellow was able to to use to create that song of Hiawatha and eventually give us the Wawa um, stores. Uh, this was uh, Schoolcraft. Schoolcraft was he married to an Ojibwe wife and uh, lived with her and his mother-in-law, and so he was able to learn a lot of the Ojibwe names for things and uh, publish that, and then uh, that was quoted and Longfellow was able to get it. So long story, long story, very interesting, but all of that just to tell us that Wawa is not a Lenape bird, but they do make great hoagies. The information that we're gonna be looking at tonight mostly comes from the Lenape uh, language project from the uh, Delaware tribe of Indians in Oklahoma in Bartlesville. And Jim Rementer, a, a local Philly kid, was very interested in the Lenape culture because of going to camp uh, growing up out here. And so uh, back in the 60s, he went out to Oklahoma to meet the Lenape people and pretty much stayed and was very interested in their language and culture and has has been instrumental in preserving so much of the vocabulary and language of the, the Unami Lenape people. And so this is, this is really a joint production of his work and my interpretation. So if there's any mistakes, they're clearly mine. And uh, we just want to shout out to Jim. Uh, he's done amazing work that we're going to get to enjoy tonight. He worked with people like Lucy Parks Blaylock and Nora Thompson Dean, who shared stories and language with him. And he was able to uh, record so much of that on tapes. Um, sadly, they are no longer with us, but you will actually hear their voices tonight. So that's part of the, the greatness of this program. It's, uh, it's, it's a joint production going back into the generations. Really quickly, the Lenape language is an Algonquian language that uh, is, is a language family that includes these other uh, these other groups and languages all the way out to the Blackfoot people in Montana and Alberta, and then down to the um, Powhatan and Carolina Algonquian peoples and the Shawnee. Uh, the Ojibwa that we were talking about with the Wawa, they're actually part of this language group. Uh, the, the actual history of how these languages are related to each other, this is always controversial, these reconstructions by historical linguists, but um, some believe that you can trace this all the way back to the Caspian Basin 
in Asia maybe 15,000 years ago, and that it has branched out as the people have spread out. And you can see the Lenape there. About 1,500 years ago, the Lenape language would have broken off from the Adena and Shawnee, peoples of the Great Lakes areas, as the people migrated and their language uh, shifts as they move around. Now, again, these are always controversial reconstructions, but it's fun to think about the history of these people moving from, uh, from Asia to the Columbia River Valley, where I grew up in, uh, in Oregon, and Snake River Valley, and then across the continent to the places where you saw all of those languages in the map. So it's kind of fun, a little deep background there. Lenape is not a living language. There are no native speakers anymore. Um, there are partial speakers, so it's in because of the work of, of Jim and, and others, a lot of it is preserved, but, but it's considered dormant. It's not extinct because there are some uses in, in, in limited search, uh, situations, but it's not fully spoken as the first uh, language by anyone anymore. And so that's very sad. Edward Leonard Thompson died in 2002. So we're over 20 years now that this language has not been spoken by anyone uh, at their, that's their first language. But let's get to the birds. Uh, so what we're gonna do tonight is look at some birds, look at their names, and you're actually gonna get to hear the native speakers uh, say the names of these birds. We'll also have some stories and other information. So starting off, uh, we get this bird. Mangesu. The Mangesu. I hope you can hear that uh, through the uh, the recording here. Um, one thing that's interesting, you notice it's listed as either a brant or a swan. So there's a little uh, ambiguity there. One of the things that happens is as the people are moved away from their traditional homeland, uh, the meanings of the words shift or they change or they lose track of exactly what some of these words meant. So there can sometimes be a little ambiguity, but this is a, let's just hear this word again. Mangesu. The Mangesu. So it could be a swan, could be a brant. If you have a duck of any type, then this is what you would call it. Quiquingum. Quiquingum. The Quiquingum. So there could be lots of Quiquingum out there. I love these words, just the way they, they sound. And again, it's not my culture. Um, don't want to appropriate it, but do want to celebrate it. It's as we are living in the, the traditional lands of these, these birds and these names. One who has a green head, the mallard. Askaskontpat. Askaskontpat. This is a beautiful bird, beautiful, beautiful name. Kiki Chimwis. The Kiki Chimwis. Kiki Chimwis. I saw a couple Kiki Chimwis this morning. And we were talking about this bird a few minutes ago, the wild turkey. Chikinem. The Chikinem. The Chikinem. Now, this is a very important bird. And we're going to just make a little digression here to talk about how important it was. Uh, actually, when the first Europeans showed up, uh, they were met by, by the Lenape people, and many of them had turkey robes or blankets or mantles. And so this was a traditional clothing item. So this they were probably even more important as a source of feathers for clothing and blankets than they were as a source of food. Uh, for the for the early Lenape peoples, um, the the way that these uh, robes were made was kind of lost. Uh, the the knowledge of how to do it was lost. Though they're trying to bring it back, this is one that was completed in 2021, and so as part of cultural revival, they're they're trying to bring some of these things back. Here is uh, one from 1940. And then interestingly, these things don't preserve well in the archaeological record here in the East because it's too wet. So they're just going to rot. You can't find them archaeologically. But out West, where it's dry, they actually find these turkey feather blankets. And this is an 800-year-old one. It's, it's, it's a, there's woven fibers. And then um, Mary Weaki, who's... Um, a Pueblo Indian, she has figured out and kind of reverse engineered how these things were made with thousands of turkey 
uh, feathers. They're actually, she rolled them. You can look her up online. She has videos of her making these, these blankets, which would last for several years and were probably super important on the cold days in the winter. You think about how did, how did people survive? Well, they, they had their, they had their shelters and then they had these very warm blankets made out of turkey feathers. Turkey feathers were also important ceremonially. So we have, we have this uh, turkey beard. Bukutem. And this, these uh, the turkey beards are made into these headdresses that are used um, by, the, by the Lenape men when they were doing ceremonies. So the turkey is an important bird for their livelihood, but also ceremonially. Which gets us into the, uh, the realm of ideas. And so when we're talking about Lenape birds, it's not just, oh, they have different words for the birds. They fit into the culture completely differently. And so we wanna just take a, a, a few moments to talk about the worldview of the Lenape people traditionally. And they had a creator God, and here's his name. Now he lives in the 12th uh, sphere. So it's like there's, there's all these levels uh, of the cosmos. Uh, when someone dies, their soul has to travel 12 days to reach that tier. And so he's far removed from the earth and what's happening here. So he created spirits, the Manituak, the Maniteo, who to, to kind of rule and govern and be in charge of and be part of, of the natural world. Everything in nature possesses this maneto, the spirit. So this is an animistic society where everything is filled with spirit, everything's alive. And you don't just live in a, in a dead world with living things that you kill and eat or grow, but everything's alive and everything has to be uh, in relationship. And so you're constantly negotiating relationships with with beings that are spiritual. And that may involve uh, making sacrifices uh, to satisfy the spirits of the deer or the bear or whatever animal that you're that you're using. And so there's complex rituals involved with negotiating the relationships between people and animals and birds and the spirits. Tobacco was very important uh, and used as an offering. Uh, early in the 20th century, uh, we got this story uh, recorded for us about this feat figure who we already saw listed before, but here's his name. Masink. Masink was, Masink was the, he's the, he's the being who's in charge of the, the animals. And um, this is the story of why um, he's represented this way with a, a mask that's red or black. This is this is a very important cultural symbol in the Lenape uh, culture. Uh, he revealed himself to some boys in a time of crisis, instructed them how to carve his face, paint it red on one side, black on the other, and was told that it would, it would help them, give them power to do whatever they needed to. And so it's used in sacred ceremonies to connect people to to the spirits that are that are in the animals and the sink was in charge of of all of those of the game um after the lenape people were moved out of our area they had a uh, religious revival in the 1800s is called the big house religion and it probably harkens back to traditions that that they had had in the in in the homeland but the, the way the form that it took may have shifted a little bit, but it was uh, it was a long multi-day set of ceremonies. So for 12 days, people would offer prayers and they would dance in this big house and it had the masks of the sink all over. And so it was just a it was it was a very important thing that, that kept the tribe together. And um Basically, the last ceremony was held in 1924. So it's been a hundred years now since since they they performed this. And so you can see how though the culture is still alive and the, it's been they've been losing ceremony language. And so it's a constant struggle to to try to preserve this in the face of 
the larger American culture. But as part of that big house ceremony, they would use these turkey wings as, as brooms to sweep the big house after they would do dances around the perimeter of that. And here's the name for the for that. <laughs> the cheeky gun was these turkey feather brooms. They would also use fans. Later, this would be used in, in Native American peyote ceremonies, but originally they would have been in the big house, these turkey feather fans. You can see some examples here. They're in the Penn Museum. So turkey feather fans. And also in this case, we've got golden eagle feathers, blue jay feathers that are part of this. So feathers in most Native American traditions are, are important. They're spiritual items. They, they connect people to spirit. And so it's offensive oftentimes for uh, non-Native peoples to put on war bonnets or, or feathers in ways to, that imitate Native Americans, but don't that, that uh, but are taking their sacred symbols and and um, appropriating them. So uh, feathers, birds, very, very important connecting people to spirit. So we'll kind of kind of get back to real birds in a moment. Don't want to say real birds necessarily, but the birds as we understand them a little bit more. But finally, um, young people would 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 uh, participate in a fast, in which they would, they were, they would have to wait until us an animal spirit would talk to them and come to them and give them power. And so this was an important initiation in their tradition as well as many other native traditions. So this was kind of funny. They would make make them paint their faces so when they were fasting, they couldn't sneak off and try to beg food from other people. Uh, they had to wait until the creator would speak to them through one of these birds or other spirits. All right, back to some of the names. Prairie chicken. Muihile. Muihile. Now, again, these people now live mostly in Oklahoma. So you may think, well, this is this must be a word they picked up when they went to Oklahoma. But... Uh, Muihile. The Muihile is actually something they would have known in their homeland because we had these prairie chickens, the heath hen, that lived on the East Coast. So uh, this was a native bird. In fact, they were so common that some of the some of the early servants in Philadelphia would beg not to be paid in heath hen bodies. <laughs> because they were just so common, they would just use them to pay the servants. Um, but they went extinct, and so they're gone. Here's another bird that's rapidly declining uh, in Pennsylvania. Pepoque. Our state bird, Pepoque, the rough grouse. Here's another one that's practically gone in the state, some efforts to try to bring it back. Pupuque. Pupuque. Don't you think we should have more Pupuque? In Pennsylvania, I think we should call them Pupuquesh as we bring them back. Another one that's lost, unless uh, unless we can do some DNA uh, restoration, we'll never see this bird alive again. So now they use this this word that used to be for passenger pigeon for the rock pigeon. So you can still use this word. Amimi. Amimi. When you're driving into Philly, you'll see lots of the modern Amimi, the rock pigeons, as you. Uh, drive in. So take note of some of these, these names. Uh, well, this will be recorded so you can go back. You can also go look at the talking dictionary and get these names again. But wouldn't it be great if we could maybe not bring back the passenger pigeon because that may not be possible, but we can bring back the connection and names that some of the people that used to live here had for nature. Um, Last year, before I was uh, knew I was moving to New York, I, I I would go birding in my local park, and I wasn't looking for rarities. It was a kind of different kind of birding than I had grown up with, where I just was trying to connect with some of my local birds. And as I did that, and as I thought about these Lenape names, it it all made sense. It all made sense. You could you could kind of feel 
the, the culture that used to be here and the connection that people had to the local ecology. Um, even the names that we use uh, for, for the birds in English, they usually come from somewhere else or we made them up. They don't, they don't have the tradition that we have. We'll get back to that in a minute. But on with more of the birds that we know. Mamet Hakemu. Mamet Hakemu. Mamet Hakenu, the, the morning dove. Here's a fun one. Wekulis. Wekulis. This kind of is an important one because it shows how many of the bird names are onomatopoetic. They sound like the bird sounds. So listen to this. Wekulis. Wekulis. It's like whip or will. What coolies? Three syllables. What coolies? What coolies? Now, here's what's interesting. Uh, in the documentation that we have, there's two words for whippoorwill. One is what coolies. What coolies? The other. Chukunizwia. Chukunizwia. Now, when I hear this, check winnowia, I think that is not the name of a whippoorwill. That can't be the name of a whippoorwill because it doesn't sound like whippoorwill. What does that sound like to me? Chuck Will's Widow. Thank you. So I asked Jim about that and he said, well, some birds have two names. And I'm like, yes, but also probably originally this would have been the name of the Chuck Will's Widow. So there's still things we're trying to learn and figure out and square away. It's difficult, as I said, because it's a dormant language. And it may be hard to reconstruct some of this, but if I had to put money on it, I would say that this is the Chuck Will's widow. Listen to this, the name of this bird. Beesh. Does that sound like what a common nighthawk sounds like? Beesh. Peesh. Peesh. Now we say paint, but peesh sounds really good for what the common nighthawk actually sounds like. So that's a very fun, fun word. And this is just a beautiful, beautiful name. Lelembolis. 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 Aren't, aren't, aren't we looking forward to when the Lelembolis are going to come back in the next in the next month and come to our feeders? I love this name too. Listen to this. Mehkalaniyad. I think we should have that name. Now, here's a good one. Iham. 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 Now, Iham, you might be able to remember that. Iham. To help us remember, uh, we have a little story that kind of shows how birds fit again into the culture a little bit. This is a, a little bit, a, a little bit of a story. It, it would be more fun if we were together. I could let someone else in the audience read this, but and I apologize for having so much words on a screen, but it's a fun story, so I thought we would just share it and, and listen to it. Long ago, the Delaware people believed that if a brave could pluck a feather from the tail of a live eagle and wear that feather, he would not only always be brave and of great courage, but good fortune would always follow him. Therefore, young hunters used to try to catch eagles by putting pieces of wolf meat on high cliffs, eagles being very fond of wolf meat. At one time, there was a young brave who was very reckless, ambitious, and daring. He wanted to get eagle feathers for a headdress and desired to pluck the feathers himself from live eagles. So he found a high place where eagles often came. Then he killed a large wolf, took it to this place, and hung a large piece of the flesh near the edge of the cliff. He then hid behind a big tree with a forked stick, ready to capture an eagle. Presently, an eagle came to get the tempting morsel, but the young brave considered this eagle too small and drove it away. Soon another came, but this one also did not seem to suit the brave. He drove away several others, not being satisfied with the plumage of any of them. All at once, he heard the flapping of heavy wings, and there alighted before him an eagle much larger than himself. The eagle, instead of looking like the others, had red feathers as if dyed in blood. This eagle did not take the wolf meat, but came straight to the brave, seized him in his talons, and carried him away to a high cliff, from which it was impossible to escape, except by jumping down, which would have been certain destruction. On this cliff was a large nest containing four young eagles. The large eagle left the brave in the nest and said to him, you shall stay here. 
and care for my young until they are large enough to carry you back to where I took you. I am the head chief of the eagles. Your greed and ambition have brought you to this. You are not satisfied with the plumage of the birds I sent you. Now you shall stay here and suffer for your greed. And perhaps when you return, you'll be glad to take such feathers as we give you. There was nothing else for the young brave to do but stay and guard the young eagles. This he did so well as to win the friendship and love of the young, weagle, young eagles as well as the old eagle who occasionally came to the nest bringing in his talents a deer, rabbit, or other game. After the brave had been there many days and young eagles had learned to fly, they would sometimes be away nearly all day and leave him alone. He would get very lonely and wonder if they were going to leave him to die of starvation or eat him up or whether they really meant to take him back where the old eagle found him. He was not kept long in suspense, however, for one day the large eagle came again and said, Now, my young friend, my grandchildren here shall carry you back to where I found you. I will go along to see that they do not drop you until you reach the place in safety. Two of the young eagles seized the brave in their talons and flew toward the cliff where he had been tempting the eagles with wolf meat. It was not far from the nest, and they soon reached the place in safety. There the brave found some eagle feathers, which he was glad enough to take without plucking them from a live eagle, and he returned with them to his people. So a little cautionary tale, kind of like uh, Aesop's fable or stories in cultures around the world that, you, that use birds and interactions between birds and people to help us learn how to be the kind of people that we want to be within the culture. So... Uh, thanks for letting me share that. Uh, here's the source of where that came from. Meanwhile, back to the birds. Opalanie. Opalanie. There's plenty of Opalanie still in Lenape Hoking, more than ever along the along the Delaware River. Now, this used to be called the Cooper's Hawk, or the, the Chicken Hawk, but that was a problem because people were killing them because they thought they were eating chickens, and they they were. And so they were named Cooper's Hawk, and now uh, we've decided we're going to change the names of all the birds that have people's uh, surnames as part of their name. And so what are we going to call Cooper's Hawk in the future? I don't know what the, the uh, ornithologists are going to call it, but I think we should just Go back. Neonil T Posset. You could have a Neonil T Posset harassing the birds at your feeder. You could you could have a whole bunch of Neonil T Possets come over uh, when you're doing a hawk watch. That's my vote. I say we go with Native American names when we can for the birds uh, that we've decided culturally we don't want to have uh, surnames attached to them anymore. Here's a good one. Mochipwis. 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 Owls of any kind? Cuckoos. Cuckoos. Now, cuckoos was, uh, it could be any owl, and I have a story that involves cuckoos. I'm saying barred owl because of how it is described in, in this story, a little bit shorter. Um, the hunter and the owl, once a Delaware man and his wife went on a long hunt, quite away from the village. They had been out several days without having any luck when one night, as they were sitting around their campfire, an owl hooted from a tree nearby and after hooting, laughed. What other owl laughs? It's got to it's got to be the barred owl, right? Anyway, so this cuckoos, he laughed. This was considered a good omen. But to make sure of this, the hunter took a chunk of fire and retired a little way from the camp under the tree where the owl was perched and laid the chunk of fire on the ground and sitting by it began to sprinkle tobacco on the live coal and talk to the owl. So this is part of these traditions that we talk about how tobacco and offerings to the spirits are important. He said, Mahomus. Mahomus or grandfather, I've heard you whoop and laugh. I know by this that you see good luck coming to me after these few days of discouragement. I know that you are very fond of the fat of the deer and that you can exercise influence over the game if you will. I want you to bring much game in my way, not only deer, but fur-bearing animals, so that I may return home with a bountiful supply of furs as well as much dried meat. And I will promise you that from the largest deer that I kill, I will give you the fat and heart of which you are very fond. I will hang them in a tree so that you can get them. 
The owl laughed again, and the hunter knew that he would get much game after that. Ooh, 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 ooh. The next morning, he arose early, just before day, and started out with his bow and arrow, leaving his wife to take care of the camp. He had not gone far before he killed a very large buck. In his haste to take the deer back to camp so that he could go out and kill another before it got too late, he forgot his promise to the owl and did not take out the fat and heart and hang it in the tree as he said he would do, but flung the deer carcass across his shoulder and started for camp. The deer was very heavy and he could not carry it all the way to camp without stopping to rest. He had only gone a few steps when he heard the owl hoot. Ooh, 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 ooh. This time it did not laugh as it had the night before. The owl flew down, low down right in front of the man and said to him, Is this the way you keep your promises to me? For this falsehood I will curse you. When you lay down this deer, you will fall dead. The hunter was quick to reply. Grandfather, it is true. I did not hang the fat up for you where I killed the deer, but I did not intend to keep it from you as you accused me. I too have power, and I say to you that when you alight, you too will fall dead, and we will see who is the stronger and who first will die. The owl made a circle or two and began to get very tired, for owls can only fly a short distance. When it came back again, it said, my good hunter, I will recall my curse and help you all I can if you will recall yours and we will be friends after this. The hunter was glad enough to agree as he was getting very tired too. So the hunter laid the deer down and took out the fat and the heart and hung them up. When he picked up the deer again, it was much lighter and he carried it to his camp with perfect ease. His wife was very glad to see him bringing in game. She soon dressed the deer and cut up strips of the best meat and hung them up to dry. And the hunter went out again and soon returned with other game. In a few days, they had all the furs and dried meat they could both carry to their home. And the hunter learned a lesson on this trip that he never afterwards forgot, that whenever a promise is made, it should always be fulfilled. So thanks again for letting me share a little Lenape lore and wisdom. Ohundum. Ohundum. Ohundum, the great horned owl. Opikukus. Opi cuckoo, so there's that cuckoo's word, but opi, so this is the white owl, the snowy owl. Chululhue. 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 What I want to do now is share just a short little um, proverb, a little, a little saying. And so you can actually, you can read it in English here, but we also have a recording of it so you can hear some of the, the, the Lenape wisdom in the Lenape language. If you're trying to follow along with the uh, the writing there, it can be it can be difficult. It's it's a very distant language, very different from ours, but uh, this is beautiful. Uh, I'm glad we can we have this recorded so that we can listen to it. This idea that screech owls uh, could be a bad omen, and uh, if you hear one, someone could die, is very common in cultures all around. Senihale. Senihale, the American kestrel. Kaokcheok. 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 I, I can't even say some of these, but uh, how beautiful are, is that? Nasweek it. I saw several of these today. Uliquin. I wish I had seen this. Papa is the red headed woodpecker. Good job. Good job. 
This how uh, all this uh this bird also has a saying with it. Kakuwe. I love that. If you hear it, um, it you're just going to be lazy all day. I mean, can you can you just imagine uh, middle of summer, no air conditioning, and the cuckoos are back, um, and you so you you hear this bird, and it just means you're going to be lazy all day long. That's a, I just I can just feel that I can I can be part of that. Here's a bird that probably was. Uh, this is not native to here, obviously, and probably was a bird that they made a, a word for when they arrived out on the Great Plains. Bahawalonias. One who has a forked tail, feathers. Bahawalonias. Here's the uh, the word for a raven. Wingale quet. Wingale quit. Wingale quit. Now, the next one is a lot of fun. Listen to this, and you tell me which species of crow you think was originally this one. Ahas. 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 Which species of crow do we think that was? I'm thinking fish crow. And if they lived along the rivers... In, in our area, then obviously that would have been a crow they would have been very familiar with. But with that two-syllable word, it's, it also is kind of nasal. Ahas. Ahas is crow. So uh, ahas, ahas. Say that a few times. Maybe next time you see, you hear a fish crow, you'll actually hear it saying its Lenape name. Ahas. 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 And look at this. The little... Tias, tank tias, tank tias. Uh, they're not the first people to notice that these guys kind of look like blue jays, but they're tiny, so they're like little blue jay. Tank tias. Machilinis. Machilinis. Now wrens, inutit. They're also uh, important. And very common around human habitation, so they have a story for this as well. So if you hear uh, this, this bird, these wrens, you, it means that someone's going to come to visit you. So the Hinutet, the Hinutet. Kakiwalis. Kakiwalis. Taskamus. Taskamus. Chuiu. Chuiu. Cheese cuckoos. Cheese cuckoos. I, I, just, I just love these. Maybe if you can get a hold of, of these names and just listen to it, say it, uh, just the way it comes off the tongue. She's cuckoos. She's cuckoos. What a great, what a great name. Chiopecalis. Chiopecalis. That just seems like a great name for that. We sell tayas. Chililis. 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 Shalilis, what a great name. Chikanak. Chikanak. Now look at this. This is very, this is a great name. I'm not even going to try to say it. Chichikanamikanwis. The notes says Chichikan in there. That was the turkey. Chichikun is the turkey. So the Eastern Meadowlark is one who flies like a turkey. And if you've ever watched these things and the way they kind of flutter flutter in when they land, uh, what a great observation. <laughs> of all the ways you could describe this bird, you're going to call it the one who flies like a turkey. What a great observation. Here's another one. 
one who was like fire. Wet and days. Wet and days. Wet and days. Wet and days. One who looks bloody. Mukwinund. 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 So these are some great names. And um, these colorful feathers uh, have been used um, in many things. And also here we have the, uh, the cardinal used as a decoration on a, a bandolier bag. These were probably created um, in colonial times, uh, modeled after the European bags. There's also, uh, fortunately, preserves many words associated with birds as we get to the end here. Here's, um, here's some of the words for feather, uh, miquen, or um, maluncon, the wing. And then oh, a nest. Oh, oh, she hi. And to leave you, don't want to leave you without having you have maybe ahas maybe you can remember ahas when you when you hear a fish crow but here's one that you can remember egg old old so it's like old but without the d old old so when you have breakfast you can you can think about the lenape people who lived here once upon a time as you eat your old. as you eat your old in the morning uh, so this has been uh, information that we're just very happy that has been preserved and hopefully someday these uh, names will be more familiar and brought back uh, that we can celebrate them and maybe even uh, some of the the land can be brought back because some things once they're gone they're just gone um aha uh chalam -huh. uh -huh. we we have no idea what bird this is we know it's a bird uh -huh. Shalom, but we've lost the bird that goes with this name and we don't want those others to be lost so um, very grateful for the uh, Lenape Talking Dictionary Project you can look that up you free to also watch this again I guess on the recording but really just shout out to, to Jim Rementer out there in Oklahoma and for all the work he's done for decades I'm just so thankful for Jim and, and for the help he's given on this on on this project. And um, thank you. There's my email if you want to reach out to me since I've left Rowan University and I'm moving to New York. I'm actually speaking to you from Palmyra, New York. Uh, so you can always reach me at birdchaser at hotmail.com. And with that, I thank you and uh, we'll take any questions.